Hello guys, welcome back to another tutorial. Hit the bell icon button so that you don't miss out any tutorial. Welcome to the first lesson in this EDU Onyx series on learning Python. Today we will introduce the Python programming language and discuss the basic details, features, and advantages of Python. Before getting started with Python programming, let's look at some of the core features of Python as a programming language. Python is a powerful and dynamic programming language that can be used for a large variety of tasks on nearly any system. Python is also completely free and open source, so useful modifications can be made to extend its functionality. Practically, Python can be used for web server development, for desktop applications, and for programming with a wide variety of database systems. There are also modules that are available for Python that extend its functionality specifically for network programming, game programming, and mobile development. Python has a number of core features that make it invaluable as a programming tool. Primarily, Python is completely cross-platform, so Python code written on a given platform can be run on any other available platform without making any changes to the Python code. Most notably, Applications written in Python can be run on Windows, most builds of Linux, and Macintosh OS X without making any changes to the Python code. Python also has an extensive collection of third-party libraries that are well documented and supported in order to extend the functionality of Python for nearly any available task. In contrast to other programming languages, Python has a dynamic data typing system, which makes dealing with data in Python simple and much easier to understand than within many other languages. Python code is clear and simple to read in comparison to other programming languages as well. In addition to this, Python has an interactive interpreter that allows programmers to instantly try out sections of code, allowing programs to be tested more quickly and more efficiently. We will use this feature of Python for many of the code samples in this course in order to see the results of our programs instantly. Python also has a complete library of documentation online, with offers complete details for any built-in function of the Python language. The Python documentation is available at the link below for further information on any particular feature of the Python programming language. At this current point in time, there are two versions of Python available. There's Python 2.7 and Python 3. Python 2 is the current stable release of Python, and Python 3 is the current version of Python that is in active development. While Python 3 features a few updates to the Python syntax for clarity, the code between the two versions is not radically different, but the differences in code have caused many popular and useful third-party modules for Python to stop working in Python 3. Until further support is provided for Python 3, Python 2.7 is still the industry standard at this point in time, and for the duration of this course, we will be exclusively working with Python 2. However, after learning Python 2, updating programs to one with Python 3 would not be difficult. In both versions of the programming language, the fundamentals remain the same. Welcome to the second lesson of our EDU Onyx series on learning Python. In this lesson, we will discuss installing Python and making sure it is set up properly on various operating systems. Generally, Python comes pre-installed for most versions of Linux that have come out recently. If you're using the latest version of Ubuntu Linux or Fedora as your operating system, then the latest version of Python should already be installed. If you're using the latest version of Red Hat Linux or CentOS, Python also comes pre-installed with your operating system. You can take the following steps to ensure that Python is already installed on your current build of Linux. This is being performed on a Debian Linux machine, but these steps should work for any build of Linux, like Ubuntu or Fedora. Navigate to the top left-hand corner of your screen and click on Applications. Navigate to Accessories and then click on Terminal. Type the word Python into the console and ensure that you see the Python interactive interpreter which shows what version of Python. The Python editor that we will be using for the duration of this course, type in sudo space apt dash get install idle.
it will download and install the Python editor. In order to make sure it has installed properly, navigate to Applications, Programming, and click on Idle. Now we have access to the interactive Python shell and a Python editor. If for some reason you cannot access Python on your Linux PC, or have an older version of any of these Linux operating systems, and your commands to check for Python did not work, you can install Python from source in Linux by following the provided instructions. First, visit the Python website, and go to the download area, and download the compressed Python 2.76 source. After you have downloaded the latest version of the Python source from Python's website, open another terminal window and type the command tar, spelled T-A-R, and then XFZ, followed by the name of the Python archive which you just downloaded. Then navigate to the folder which you've just created, which should be named the same thing as your archive. Type the command dot slash configure. Then type the word make Then type the word make install. The latest version of Python should now be installed on your Linux system. Simply type the word Python into the terminal again to ensure that this is the case.
the latest version of Python should be shown in your terminal window. Installing Python on a Macintosh system is fairly straightforward. Visit the Python website and navigate to the download section and find the version of Python 2.7 that is specific to your Macintosh system. Simply download the installer file and run it on your system in order to install Python. To install Python on Windows, simply visit the Python website, navigate to the download section, and download the version of Python 2.7 that is specific to your Windows machine. Simply run the downloaded installer file and let it finish and then Python should be installed on your Windows operating That concludes our lesson on installing Python on all of the available operating systems. Welcome to the third lesson of our EDU Onyx series on learning Python. Today we will discuss writing your first program with the Python programming language. Before you begin programming with Python, you will need an understanding of a few basic programming concepts. Programs are partially constructed with functions. A function is simply a pre-built set of instructions for your computer to follow. Functions are used to perform actions in the programs that you write. Functions can be used by typing the name of the function you wish to access and whatever data you want that function to work with into your Python code. The statement in your code that you use to access a function is referred to as a function call, and the data you pass that function to work with is referred to as a parameter. For example, in Python, there is a built-in function to print text to the Python console window, known as the print function. You would call that function by typing the word print into your Python program and then typing the word or phrase you want it to print afterwards. To look at a practical example of using functions and start writing our first Python program, let's start up the Python editor and navigate to the file menu and click new window to start writing a new Python program. Let's first start by typing the print function as the first line in our Python program. This statement of code will access the Python print function and print a line of text that we specify to the screen. The, our Python editor highlights the word print because it knows it is a built-in function of the Python programming language. Afterwards, we can simply type in the words that we want Python to print to the console window. Make sure to type any words you want the program to print between quotes, as Python has to know what type of data it's dealing with. We'll talk more about data types later, but for right now, any text you want your function to print out has to be within quotes. Then, when you're prepared, save the program. and simply hit F5 in your Python editor to run it and see the output. Let's look at our Python program in a little more depth. At this point in the code, we are making a call to the built-in Python print function, as we discussed earlier, and asking it to print out the data we have passed it over here, which is a string of text. You can use functions as many times as you want throughout your code to accomplish whatever purpose you need to do. For example, let's add a few more print statements to this Python program. then save it again and run and see what happens. Python prints out both print statements that we have passed to the Python program. Functions are the basis of a lot of the programming we'll do in Python, so it's important to have a concrete understanding of the basics of how functions work and how they can be used to enhance your programs. That concludes our lesson on writing your first Python program. 
Welcome to the fourth lesson of our EDU Onyx series on learning Python. Today we will be discussing how to comment your code and the importance of comments in programming as well as some good practices for commenting your code. A comment is simply a line of text within your Python code that is not read by the Python programming language. In Python, comments are denoted by the pound symbol. This is very useful within the realm of programming because it allows you to place explanations alongside your code. Now let's open up idle and write another basic Python program so we can see how commenting works in the Python programming language. Again, let's start off our program with another print statement and then give it some text to print out. But then below it this time, let's add a pound symbol and type some words to explain what this line of code does. We can then save our Python program. and then hit the F5 key to run it. Although we have added another line to our Python program, because the comment is not read by the Python programming language, our program gives us the exact same output when run in Python as it would if the comment did not exist. While your comment doesn't make too much of a difference in this relatively small Python program, as you begin to write more and more complex programs with Python, comments will become invaluably important to your development process. As you learn Python and continue to write code that grows longer and more complex, it will become extremely important to you to learn the practice and technique of properly commenting your code. Commenting programs properly makes them easier to understand not only for your own sake, but also makes it possible to work on projects with other developers effectively by allowing you to communicate through the code. Commenting also allows you to quickly modify your code accurately. Comments allow you to see problems in your code and make adjustments accordingly when you are writing a large Python program. Here is an example of how comments can help you explain a complicated Python program. While this program deals with some programming techniques we haven't covered yet in this course, the comments in the program itself can help you understand what each individual line of programming does. This shows how comments can be useful when working with complicated Python programs. That covers the basics of commenting within the Python programming language. Today we will discuss the basics of variables and data types. Now that we've looked at some basic operations with Python code and written a simple program, let's look at some critically important data structures so we can continue handling data and writing programs. The basis of programming in nearly any programming language is the usage of variables. A variable is simply a container that can hold information for later use in your program. In Python, we name a variable a keyword and then assign it a value so that we can access that value anywhere later in our program. If you want to access data at all in Python, you will need to use some kind of variables in order to store that data and perform operations with it in your Python program. For example, if you are writing a program that performs some kind of calculations concerning a number of objects, you would most likely need to use a variable to store the information about the amount of objects you have, as opposed to having to re-enter that number every time you need access to that information. You could call that variable numobjects and assign it the value you need for your calculations. Let's look at an example in Python. Let's open up the Python interactive interpreter so that we can get a quick look at how variables work 
in the Python programming language. Let's declare the number of objects variable we were talking about earlier in this lesson. First, to declare a variable in Python, you type the variable name keyword, and then assign it a value by adding the equal sign and a number. Now that variable carries the value 15. If we type the variable name into our Python interactive interpreter, it returns the value 15 to us, letting us know that the variable num underscore objects has the value 15 right now. In Python, while you can name your variable nearly anything, there are a few specific rules concerning what characters you are allowed to have in your variable name. Variable names cannot contain spaces, start with a number, or be any of the Python language keywords so as not to confuse what object you are referring to. Python language keywords will be highlighted in nearly any available Python editor, so they can be easily identified. Also. Variable names in Python cannot can contain any special character with the exception of the underscore character. In this slide, you can see some examples of both good and bad variable names. When using the Python Interactive Interpreter or any Python editor, when you type in a Python language keyword, let's say, for example, we use the print function like we talked about earlier when starting Python, It is highlighted yellow so that you know it is a Python language keyword and cannot be used as a variable name. The first and most basic type of data available to us in Python is the integer. Like in mathematics, an integer can be any positive or negative whole number that doesn't contain any decimal information. The first and most basic type of data available to us in Python is the integer. Like in mathematics, an integer can be any positive or negative whole number that doesn't contain any decimal information. In Python, the integer data type is commonly abbreviated as int. We can use the type function in Python to see what type of data a specific variable is. Let's create another basic integer variable and then look at what type it is by using the type function. So first let's create our variable. In this instance, let's call it velocity and assign it a basic value. And then let's use the type function by typing the word type and an open parentheses and then typing the name of our variable. It tells us that the type of our variable is int, or integer, in the Python programming language. For dealing with decimal numbers, Python has another data type known as the floating point number, or float, in Python. Variables that contain decimal information in Python are assigned to the floating point data type. Let's look at that velocity variable we created last time again, but this time let's pass it some decimal information. And now let's call the type function one more time on our velocity variable to see what kind of output it gives us. It lets us know that the velocity variable is of type float, or a floating point number, and that it contains decimal information as a result of this. One last and very important data type we will be working with today in Python is the string. Any kind of text data in Python is stored as a data type known as string. A string can be any length of text and can contain any set of characters or numbers. 
Strings are denoted by a set of quotes in Python. This is why it was important for us to put our text between quotes in our first program, since we wanted to make sure Python dealt with it as text, and not as some kind of numerical value or variable. Let's create one more variable and use the type function to see what kind of type Python has defined it as. Let's create our variable phrase and pass it some text between quotes. Now when we use our type function, Python will let us know that the variable phrase has the data type string. With the various data types that we've just looked at in Python, there are a number of simple operations we can perform on variables. This is where it will become very important to know the data type of the variables we are working with. Let's open a new window with our Python editor and look at an example of how data types can become very important to us when performing data operations. So first, let's create two variables, number one and number two. While these are numbers, I've declared them as a string. This will present to us one of the very important reasons for data typing in Python. Because when I add these two numbers, although we would like them to add the values of the numbers together, Python deals with strings very differently than it does integers or floating point numbers. Let's have it print out the value of number one plus number two. Let's save and then run our Python script and see what happens. It prints out 12 instead of 3 as you might have expected, because when Python works with strings, the add operator simply puts the two strings together instead of actually adding the values of the numbers. Since Python doesn't know we're dealing with numerical values, it has dealt with our addition as strings. Let's look at a similar example, but this time, let's make sure Python operates on our data in the correct way. So once again, let's declare two variables, number one and number two. But this time, let's assign their values to be integers and not strings, and see what Python does. And once again, let's use the print function to print out the value of this addition. And then let's save and run our simple Python program and see what happens. Python prints out the correct number this time because it knows that it's dealing with integer values instead of strings. To get a quick overview of all the concepts we've looked at so far, let's write a simple program that performs some simple calculations concerning time. So first, let's declare a variable called minutes and assign it the value 60. In order to make your code clearer to read, you can add comments. Then let's declare a variable called hours and assign it the value 24. Then let's use one more variable entitled days and assign it the value 7.
From here, we can perform some simple data operations to find out the amount of minutes per day and the amount of hours per week and have that printed out to the user for this simple program. So first, let's create a print statement and then perform the calculation that would tell us the amount of minutes per day, which is simply minutes times hours. We use the asterisk symbol in order to denote multiplication in the Python programming language. And then let's print some text to let us know the value we're printing out. Let's have this program perform one more simple calculation. The amount of hours per week by multiplying hours times days and having that value printed out. Then we can save our program and run it to see the simple calculations that have been performed. That wraps up the basics of variables and data types and data operations in the Python programming language. Welcome to the sixth lesson of our EDU Onyx training series on learning Python. Today we will cover handling user input. While we have looked at a number of ways to perform calculations and display output to a user, using functions like the print function, making complex programs in any programming language will not only require displaying output, but will require getting input from a user as well. In Python, there is a simple way to prompt the user for input and store the information they supply in a variable known as the input function. The input function operates differently than the functions we've looked at so far in Python. Rather than performing an action that is displayed to us in the console, the input function will get input from our user and return a value that needs to be assigned to a variable. Let's open up the Python Interactive Interpreter and write a basic program that gets some input from our user. So first, we're going to need a variable to hold the input that our user supplies. Let's just create a small variable called number so far. And then let's assign the value of number to the input function. Here we'll supply some text to prompt the user with when we want them to enter a value. And now let's run our statement. Python prompts us with the text that we supplied to our input function. And when we enter a value, the number variable has now been assigned the value that we've entered. Let's take a look. The input function takes a simple parameter, a string, with the text that you want to prompt the user with, and then runs prompts the user with that string and assigns whatever value they input to the variable you have assigned to the input function. Data types are important when using the input function as your variable will automatically become whatever data type of input is given to it. Make sure to specify what kind of data you are looking for from the user to avoid errors. In some specific cases, you might want to read all input from the user as a string and then convert it to other data types later as necessary, which we'll look at later in this course. This means that you won't need quotes when typing in strings for input and might make input simpler for your users in some specific cases. For this, Python has another function similar to the input function known as raw underscore input. You can make use of the raw input function in exactly the same way you would use the input function. Simply declare a variable
and set it equal to the raw input function with your prompt text as the parameter. Just remember that whatever text or values is entered into this input prompt will be returned as a string, regardless of the type of value. Since we've looked at data types, how to get input from our user, and basic data operations, let's write a simple program so we can look at all of these things together. Let's write a small calculator application that will return to us the product of any two numbers that we input. So first, in order to do this, we'll need two input statements to get two different numbers from our users. Whatever numbers the users enter will be stored in the number one and number two variables that we have just declared. Then let's just simply print out the result of the multiplication calculation. We use the asterisk symbol in Python to denote multiplication. And then to clarify our program, we can add some more text and comments. Then all we need to do is save our program and run it to see the result of our calculation. We can enter two simple numbers to make sure our program works. That covers the basics of getting input from a user in Python. Welcome to the seventh lesson of our EDU Onyx series on learning Python. Today we will be covering reading and writing files within the Python programming language. Most programs you will write will need some way to store data that persists for more than a single session of the program. Variables can store data from user input, but as soon as we close our program, that data is essentially gone till the next run of the program session. Right now, all of the programs we have been writing either work with data that has been built into the program with variables that have been supplied values, or has been supplied by the user for a single program session. In order to store data that persists over multiple runs of a single program, you will need to learn how to read data from files and write data to files. In order to start reading and writing files with Python, we will need to look at the basics of an advanced concept in programming, which we will study later in detail, known as object-oriented programming. Objects are simply abstract data structures that have both attributes and functions, which can perform actions involving the specific object we are working with. Objects themselves are simply instances of classes, which are predefined sets of instructions for the functions and attributes for a specific object. For example, you might think of a class as the blueprints for how to build a specific machine, and the object as the actual machine. The object performs the actions and has the attributes defined for its class. We will go into more specific detail concerning programming with objects later, but for right now, we only need to understand the basics of objects to write data to file. In the same way that you would define a variable, you can create an object by creating a name and assigning it data of whatever object type you wish it to be. 
you can create a file object by using the open function in Python which will return a file object to whatever name you wish. This function will open a file and create a file object for you in Python to perform actions with. You will need to specify a file name as a string for the open function and also you will need to specify a mode. In this case, to start off, we will use the string w for the mode parameter to specify that we are going to write data to our file. Let's start off by creating a simple file object and writing some data to it. To start, we'll need a name similar to how we created variables early on in this course. The same rules apply for variable names as they do to creating objects. Next, let's assign this variable to the open function and pass it a file name as a parameter first. And in the next parameter, we'll, first we'll add a comma to denote that we're heading to the next parameter for this function. And then we'll type the string w to specify that we want to create a file for writing. If the file that we're looking for doesn't already exist, when we specify the w string, Python will create the file. Next, let's create some basic text so that we can write to this file and so we can look at how objects work a little closer. Just create a simple string variable with some text in it. And then, from here, we can look at the basics of our file object. Our file object has several functions we can call from itself. First, we'll reference the file object, and then add a dot to let Python know we want to access a function of the file object. From there, we can use the write function, which will write whatever data we pass it to the file object. From here, we can type our string and now, when we run this program, our phrase string will be written to the file, but in order to finish up, when you open a file, you also must close it at the end, which is another method of the file object. All you need to do now is save and run this program, and it will create and write the string to your hard drive. While there won't be any direct output to the Python console to let you know that your file has written properly, you can navigate to your Python directory and locate the file that you have created and make sure the text you have written to file is in there. This is the same file that we've just created but loaded up in a text editor so we can see the contents. Python has properly written the string we have passed it to our file object to file. There is a very similar process involved for reading data from file. Let's use the same file that we just wrote and read it back into Python and then print the text to make sure that we can use our file object. So first let's create another file object with another open function statement. Let's use the same file name that we created before to make sure we load the right file. But this time, for the next parameter, let's specify an R, which lets Python know we want to read data from this file instead of write to it. Next, let's create our phrase string again, but this time 
let's not pass it any data from Python, but rather let's get some data from our file by using the read function that is part of our file object. Then let's close our file object. And then print the data that is stored in the phrase string now. Then save and run the program to see the results. Python has loaded our data from file into our file object and then printed it through our phrase string. Now that we've looked at both reading and writing files, let's create a simple program that keeps a list of usernames from run session to run session. So first, we'll need a variable to hold the current username of this run session. We want to get that as input from the user, so let's call the input function and give the user a prompt. Once we've gotten that from the user, we'll want to create a file object and save that user data to file. This time, however, we'll use the A string for mode because we want to append data to the file. That is, each run of the program, we want to open the file and write something new into it as opposed to creating a new file or simply reading from it. Then we'll write our username to the file object. In order to ensure that our data is clear in the file, at the end of our user string, we'll add a character that looks like backslash n, but all it simply does is add a new line to the file after each username is written to make the file read more cleanly. Then we'll close our file object and get on to the reading part of this program. Now we'll create a second file object in order to read the data from the file we've been writing to into our Python program. Make sure we specify the same file name, but this time let's use the R mode to specify that we want to read from this file. Let's create a user list variable to hold the list of users that have been typed into the file. Let's make sure to read data from our second file object so that we have our previous user list. Then let's print the user list to the user and give them some information about what they're seeing. At this point, our program is ready to run, 
and let's pass it some data a few times to make sure that the information in our usernames file is continuing from session to session. So first, let's enter one username and then run the program again. The first user is now added to the list of users in our username file. Let's close the program and try it one more time with a second user. This time, let's specify a second user to see the difference when we look at our user list. This time, both users have been written to file and added to our user list. Thank you for watching. Don't forget to subscribe to the channel. If you like the video, do give us a thumbs up and share it. Also check out amazing discounts and offers on our premium courses in the description below.